Alright, here we go. Take one. <laughs> afternoon and thank you for tuning in to this is our first podcast of this new year my name is eric mccoy and i'm high while clean you know there's nothing that empowers me more on my quest to find individuals to broadcast on this show than what i would classify as big thinkers uh people who are you know really able to see the reality of our substance abuse issues and find creative ways to do something about it. My guest today is what I would probably classify as one of those big thinkers, and his bio portrays exactly that. Leonard Bouchel is the founder of Writers in Treatment, which is to promote treatment, and according to the way they put it, as the best first step solution for addiction. He is the director of Real Recovery Film Festival, and this uh, showcases filmmakers who make honest films about addiction, alcoholism, and other behavioral disorders. Leonard is the editor and publisher of the weekly Addiction Recovery e-Bulletin. He produces the annual experience, Strength and Hope Awards in Los Angeles. Leonard... I want to thank you for joining me today and allowing me to explain your bio. <laughs> well, thank you for the fabulous introduction. I couldn't have done it better myself. Eric, nice to meet you. This is our first go round. Absolutely. Uh, I think someone once had a show called Cleaning While High uh, back in the day, but I like the high while clean. Yeah, you know, it was, it was kind of like what I was saying, you know, was that you know, what I am seeking today is nothing different than what I was seeking when I was getting loaded. And, and that's to get high. And I found a way to do it clean and sober. And my son reminds me of a Timothy Leary quote, where he said, uh, the, the goal is not to get high, but, <clears throat> but to be high. There you go. Absolutely. And I tell people, in sobriety, there's no coming down. This is it. You know, I was, I did a little bit of research on you and, you know, to put this thing together. And I found something very interesting and something that really kind of excited me. So, you know, in 2003, um, I started school to be a substance abuse counselor. And one of the assignments that we were given was to use a transformative thinking and identify a treatment modality that does not currently exist today. Mm, Great assignment. My entire treatment modality, it revolved around laughter. And this is why this really kind of excited me because when I was doing research on on you, I found Mm -hmm. you are the co-founder of the Laughter Heals Foundation that promotes the healing power of laughter. That was a a mission that I undertook with a fantastic comedian named Craig Shoemaker. That was about 15 years ago. And he still runs it today. I'm no longer involved. Uh, And it was called Laughter Heals. And we would go into some uh, nursing homes and there's a cancer recovery support group nearby and just promote the the healing power of laughter. Uh, There's a very famous article about a gentleman who who, uh, 
very famous publisher whose name I forget. Norman. Was Norman it? Cousins. Norman Cousins. Yes. Who was diagnosed with a serious illness. And instead of going to the hospital, he went to a hotel and rented or bought 16 millimeter reels of Marx Brothers movies and watched them and laughed himself back to health. Now, of course, there have been more uh, uh, clinical studies done how laughing, it, it's, uh, you use a lot of muscles, it, it you know, produces endorphins. Uh, in Japan, I'm told that some people while they're driving will, will put a chopstick in their mouth so it, so it makes them smile. Because just you're telling your brain to smile uh, and it helps. I had read something on that also, and it raises T cells. So it actually helps fight off infections, which is, mm -hmm. I think, what ultimately happened with him. And I think it happened twice, didn't it? With Norman Cousins? Yeah, I think he was diagnosed twice with mm. and, uh and was the man that considered to laugh himself well. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and it's, it's obvious, obviously, how you feel better after laughing and how when babies are born, the first thing you want them to do is laugh. Uh, and, and they do. Uh, so very famous comedians, if they don't die young, they like people like Bob Hope and other comedians and even Jerry Lewis, they live, they live a long life. Yeah. The ones that don't succumb to drugs or suicide or accidents, yep can live a long life. Yeah, and I, I noticed you also then had done, um, had kind of promoted something with Dr. Patch Adams. We had a Patch Adams day uh, here. Patch Adams, I remember because when I called his assistant on the phone, he answered the phone at his home. I think it was North Carolina. And he never had a cell phone. And he responds to all of his fan mail written. He doesn't use a computer. And at one point, I think he said he, he memorized 40 hours worth of poetry so that whenever he was anywhere or even alone, he knew that much poetry, which I guess if you're online and on Instagram and Facebook, you might not have the time to memorize that much poetry, but he was never on Facebook. Uh, remarkable guy, yeah. you know, as, and, and if you haven't seen the movie with Robin Williams, may he rest in peace, it's called Patch Adams and it's not a bad film. It's a great movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, a good movie. How well, how well did uh, Robin Williams, um, was he like him? Not, not, he didn't mimic him or imitate him. He made it his own. Patch is taller and a little bit more homespun yet dignified. So not that much. But the message was there that... Uh, you, know, you try and do things differently. You're going to get you're going to get some slack in the medical uh, institutions that Patch worked at, and Patch to this day uh, won't charge his patients any more than they can afford to pay. So I guess he still has a little private practice uh, wherever he lives. So. I noticed you have a, your Real Recovery Film Festival. How did that get there? <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't want to miss any opportunity to show off our girl. So tell me a little bit about that. How do, what, what is that about and how does that work? Um, 15 years ago, no, many more years ago, I, uh, I went to see the movie Leaving Las Vegas when I lived in San Rafael, California. And I went to a matinee and I was newly sober and I'm watching Leaving Las Vegas, true story uh, about a man whose intention is to drink himself to death. And it, 
And even though it's not a happy ending, it made me want to drink again. It triggered me. Uh, there's scenes in there that just make drinking look so amazing. Uh, there's also a great line in the movie, uh, Leaving Las Vegas, where the woman, the girl asks him, why are you trying to kill yourself with drinking? And he says, it was a good idea when I thought of it, but I forgot why. He forgot why he was trying to drink himself to death. Uh, and I'm sure it was something. Anyway, so he does drink himself to death. And I wanted to drink after that movie. And I thought, oh, God, uh, I shouldn't have seen that movie alone. And I went to an Alano club and just waited there until the next AA meeting and went. And eventually the feeling passed, the craving passed. And then when the time came to, in Los Angeles to rent a movie theater and watch Leaving Las Vegas with an audience. So we watched it with an audience and we had a clinician do a Q&A afterwards so that people who were interested in the film in the audience could talk about it afterwards and talk about getting triggered or talk about seeing this movie made them never want to drink again 100%. And so we were able to discuss it and no one went home alone. So that first film festival, uh, was at a beautiful theater in LA and we showed mostly classics like Lost Weekend and The Days of Wine and Roses. So people could come and not watch it alone and talk about it. We've always had for the last 13 years we've been doing this, we always have a Q&A after every film either the filmmaker if they're around or a clinician of some kind. So it's a very interactive experience. Uh, so we started that in LA 13 years ago. We just did our 12th annual film festival online for the first time this year. Uh, you know, it, it, it was, it's been in LA for 12 years and New York for eight years and Denver. Uh, it's been in a number of cities and this year, Obviously, it had to be online where everything else is. And, and it was November. And this year, we're planning to be online again. We thought we could do L.A. and New York in the theater. But I don't think theaters are going to be open for 100% capacity by October or November. Hopefully, I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. But unfortunately, it seems like things are getting worse before they get better. Uh, and I'm in L.A., and as everybody knows, L.A. is the new New York, and it's, it's frightening. It's, it's frightening to have something like this going on. And not going to meetings. You know, is, uh, we started doing a series uh, last August. Every month we do a series with like fairly well-known people in recovery who talk about how to stay sober during a pandemic uh, with all the challenges and difficulties that the world is going through and we personally are going through and how do you stay sober without physical AA meetings and how does Zoom work for some people? It works well for some, doesn't work that well for me. And, but it's been a very good series. It's called Chasing the News, Stone Cold Sober. And I won't list the people that have been on it, but people that everyone wants to listen to, uh, including Dr. Gabor Mate, the author of In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. He was our last guest in December. Uh, and it's terrific to tell people how little techniques and little, you know, you have to up your up your phone calls to friends, up your meditation practice. Uh, how do you do it? I'm not a big Zoom person. I do it once or twice a week. Uh, I go to a meeting in the park in Los Angeles. Everyone's six feet away with masks, but it feels uh, good to me. It feels good. So I don't know if that was your question. I want to get your idea on something. So, you know, this podcast, High Wall Clean, it serves 
a couple of purposes. But one of the major purposes that I put this together was to offer a platform for anybody to tell their story, right? And this experiment, which has been interesting, and it really showed me something, right? Most of our society that haven't battled with a crippling addiction like us, mm -hmm. we see the problem through the eyes of a camera in movies. Right. You know, part of fighting the stigma is the misinformation, of course, that, you know, I am trying to, you know, correct in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Podcasts, you know, um, out there and a lot of the podcasts, you know, do they highlight actors, they highlight actresses, they highlight musicians. And, you know, these stories aren't realistic to the majority of those that are in addiction in a lot of ways. You know, I've had, you know, Jeremy Jackson, I had uh, Wes Gear, you know, from mm -hmm. Doctor Recovery, uh, Bob Forrest I had on here. Um, you know, Bob, Bob and Jeremy are friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, Bob has a great movie, Bob and the Monster. Yes, he does. Was, yeah, really good. You know, and so I wrote a book called um, Pain, Failure and Misery are the Stepping Stones to Success. And, you know, in my book, it's sort of a part autobiography. It's a true crime story. Uh, you could definitely make a movie out of my story. Um, because, you know, I was an average of committing, you know, eight to 10 residential burglaries a night, selling dope. I was check fraud, credit card. It was catch me if you can, <laughs> you know, kind of story. Um, getting arrested, you know, four times in, in six months, looking at 15 years in prison and all that stuff, you know. And, you know, I was, I'd really kind of, you know, thought about how, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is, how realistic, you know, when we promote like the movies or we promote the actors or we promote the actresses, which is I know the people that obviously people want to listen to. They don't want to usually just listen to your average Joe Smo who's got a great story that could definitely help a lot of people. Okay. But since they don't know the name, they're not going to listen to them. <laughs> okay. Being able to tell the realistic stories that you know, apply to the majority of people in our society that are holed up, you know, in a motel rooms. You know, the film festival, the Real Recovery Film Festival, I think this might be relate to what you're saying. You know, our first criteria for accepting submissions is that it's a, the film is an honest depiction of whatever disorder or behavioral uh, disorder people have, alcoholism, drug addiction. Uh, and uh, and we had we, we showed 85 films last November over a week. We had 85 different films, shorts, documentaries, features. And the, the, the initial criteria is that it's an honest depiction. And I've always said we love to get as many clinicians into the theater as possible so they can actually see how their clients live when they're not in their office because people can come to a therapist and present in, a, in one way, but actually have lived or are living in a much different way, which these films depict. Mm -hmm. uh, it was some old timer in AA said, thank God there's a stigma against alcoholism, otherwise people wouldn't stop. Uh, sometimes people say there's a stigma against sober people, which I have fortunately not found and I have a newsletter that I'd like to mention the addiction recovery e-bulletin that's been going out every Tuesday for the last eight years uh, like stigma stigma kills yes but luckily people are against drug use I think if it's hurt, if it's hurt let me put it this way. I'm personally a believer that all drugs should be legalized. I think it's absolutely barbaric that anybody is accosted or arrested or put into jail for what they're doing to their own body. Uh, you know, commit a crime, pay the time. But if you're just getting high at home, snorting your, you know, gram after gram of Coke, 
I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem with what people do to themselves. That's where that, that statement was, is, is there a thing as a crime with no victim? The victimless crime, like prostitution. Yeah. Uh, although people will argue that's definitely not a victimless crime. Uh, and, and, and drug use, they just let out 500,000 people yeah. in the state of Ohio who were serving time for marijuana offenses. Yeah. I mean, the fact that in Los Angeles, every other block, there is a place you can buy marijuana legally, and it's no longer medical marijuana. It's just marijuana to get high. And there are people serving time in other bar in states around the country for marijuana possession or even marijuana dealing. And now there's people making millions, and it's okay because they're paying taxes and they're, you know, and, and everything's fine. So the system has been so messed up for so long mm -hmm. that maybe that's why there's COVID. Maybe that's why there's 40,000 overdose deaths a year. It's probably more than that. Uh, maybe that's why kids can get out of high school and still not know how to read. The system has broken down in America for a long time now as on display by the last four years, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. 300,000 people died, 200,000 of them died unnecessarily because if we had a national policy back in March, testing masks, most of these people would still be alive. But instead we had a leadership that enjoys seeing blood dripping out of their own mouths because they are vampires and monsters, actual monsters, monsters who like seeing people die mm -hmm. are ruling our country. Uh, before it used to be people ruling our country who only like to see teenage boys dying in, in, in wars, you know, uh, uh, not, not here, you know, send young boys to war so they don't, sleep with your wife but whatever mm -hmm. uh but now it's like it's insane it's insane and people who have gotten off drugs and stay off drugs these are the chosen people to me that's like walking on water to have been a drug addict or an alcoholic and now you walk through life day by day clean and sober trying to be positive trying to be nice which we fail at sometimes, but oftentimes we are better people, whether it's the teller at the bank or walking across the street. And, you, and, and it's amazing. We are the chosen people. This is the greatest cult I've ever been a member of. You know, and I think it's the great thing is that most of the people I know in 12-step programs would have never joined anything else. You know, they were definitely rebels and loners and they just wanted to commune with their uh, higher power through alcohol and drugs. And now they have to do it just by breathing. We're, we're very fortunate people for, and anybody out there who still uses drugs and still drinks, do it, you know, as long as it's serving you. And if it's not serving you, figure out why you want to kill yourself or why you're a masochist and, and, and talk to someone. You know, it's like yeah. the treatment industry in this in, in the country is is uh, is what what is what is the how would you describe the treatment industry in America, Eric? You know, this that's actually a topic I wanted to actually discuss with you. Um, before we do, real quick, I want to say something though. I wanted to, I wanted to kind of when I started this, and the reason I brought that question up before was, you know, this podcast that I do. And the reason I started this was, you know, I, I've been in the industry since 2003. And I've seen all the ups and downs, the, the good things, the craziness, the insurance fraud, you know, all the stuff that, that, you know, went along with everything that, you know, transpired. And I, my style of counseling is a very thinking outside the box style. It's a, it's not the whole directive method. 
I find that when we actually give more encouragement, when we give more love, when we help them think for themselves, <laughs> that this is where we find more productiveness. You know, I have thought so hard on, you know, our educational system, what we do with the schools, you know, the whole concept of I'm going to scare people, you know, away from doing drugs is bullshit. You know, you know, it, it doesn't really work. And, you know, so I hit a point to where I was trying to reach out to like the governor, you know, and I was trying to reach out to like different politicians and trying to reach out to different people to, you know, talk to them about some various different ideas that I have. Of course, nobody wants to listen to me because, no, you know, I'm a nobody who, who really, um, you know, apparently in their mind doesn't have any good information, maybe because I'm a six time convicted felon. And, uh, you know, and that, you know, is sort of a, and so I, so I started this podcast um, strictly for this reason was like, you know what, if anybody will listen to me, I want, I'm going to, I got stuff I want to say. And, you know, we hit like, uh, you know, there was that uh, bill that was trying to go through in terms of we're going to eliminate the vape juice, right? Another prohibition, you know? So I did a podcast called another prohibition. Fuck you. Right. <laughs> That's kind of what I titled it, you know, um, because, you know, in my mind, I know that, um, you know, we can prohibit anything and everything we want. All it does is grows a black market. I go online. I can buy heroin. I can buy Coke. I can buy everything online, get it shipped right to my house, you know? Um, and so if I, you know, if we've got 16 year olds, 17 year olds that we're worried about with doing, you know, using vape, they're going to go online. They're going to buy it. It's probably going to have fentanyl in it. Who knows where they're getting it from? And mm -hmm. to me, it almost seems, why are we creating another prohibition? So this was the whole reason I did this podcast was because, you know, I wanted to see and test out this idea of maybe somebody will listen to me. Right. And I've had some amazing guests on this show that are non entertainment people that are drug users and stuff like that, um, that have amazing, fantastic stories. Now it's the Jeremy Jackson's and the Bob Forrest, of course, that everybody listens to. <laughs> and the Leonard Bouchelles. <laughs> and the Leonard Bouchelles, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, you know, honestly, and I love Jeremy. I love having you on here. I love having, you know, all these people on here. Um, but it was my, my idea that I was just thinking about was, you know, how can I get people to want to listen to the other people that have real stories that have great ideas that have amazing uh, things that actually can help people, but because they don't have a name, they don't want to listen to them. <laughs> well, then, then they should be at least beautiful or funny. That would help. Yeah. So um, now your question, I wanted to, I wanted to actually respond to, um, you know, I, I read somewhere um, where you had actually said the treatment industry is a $35 billion a year bonanza gold rush, according to Forbes magazine, attracting the cunning and the greeting. Not everyone is a culprit. The heart of the industry is equitable, fair, and compassionate. Mm -hmm. And the bulletins, e-bulletins motto is stick with the good guys. Addicts and their families deserve to be emboldened and not bamboozled, right? Yes. I like that. I love what you said there. And when I, wrote, when I wrote my book, Pain, Failure, and Misery are the Stepping Stones to Success, I wrote it for a lot of reasons. And one of them was I also had a chapter that is called Is Good Help Out There? And this was a result of me, um, you know, watching all of the stuff that started happening in the industry. You know, you had, you know, clients getting paid. You had referrers going to, to NAA meetings, getting people loaded that were weak so they could sell them to a detox and, you know, all of that stuff. Right. And I wrote the chapter. One was because I wanted to blast out everything that was going on there just so people could actually hear the real story behind it in that chapter. Um, and also to answer that question, is good help out there? And, um, and so I did put a lot of information in there. Now, on your statement that you said, um, 
what is your idea as far as, okay, sticking with the good guys and how do people know that they're sticking with the good guys? Well, reputation, recommendation, talk to alumni who've gone through a program and see what they have to say. I, I don't, I fortunately, when I got sober 26 years ago, I went to the Betty Ford Center uh, because the only person I knew on earth who was clean and sober went there. And she'd been a girlfriend of mine and she went off there and uh, came back and wasn't as much fun. Uh, but we stayed friends. And then one day I was having my bottom and I ran into her and I got the number uh, because she had gone there and stayed clean and sober and had good things to say about it. Uh, it was only like a five hour drive from where I lived. Uh, so I went there and haven't picked up or drank since. And I had used drugs of one kind or another for 26 years of my life every single day. I didn't know it was, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know. I thought quantum physics somehow could prove to me that you cannot go a day without drugs. It's just not possible. But that's from using drugs for 26 years. And when I went there, and at the end of 28 days, I wasn't in t thinking of giving up weed. Of, of, well, when I went there, I wasn't going to give up weed. I was sort of went for because I was having a nervous breakdown. Uh, and I drove myself there. And when I got there, I said, is this where you check in? And they looked at me. They said, no, it's not a hotel. It's a hospital. This is where you get admitted. They're going into the nurse's room for a blood test. So I realized it wasn't a hotel or a resort. And after being there for 28 days, I realized, wow, I just went 28 days without using drugs. It's, um, it's amazing. And... And then I went to a 12-step meeting and heard something and thought, hmm, let me try this. Let me try this. And I said, I'll try it for a year. If, if I don't like it after a year, I can always go back to using. Luckily, I, it's, it, it's stuck. And I, and, I, and I realized that it's sustainable. The life of a clean and sober person is sustainable. And the life of a drug addict and a drug dealer will end prematurely uh, one way or another. So I was thrilled. Uh, and all they do, and, and I went because she went and, and my son ended up going seven years after, seven years after I did. And he was 19 at the time. And he went in the year 2000. And he hasn't picked up in 21 years either because for that month, it gives you a, to me, a good rehab puts you in an environment that gives you the space to change your mind about how you want to live and die. And they can do it with group therapy, with one-on-one -on -one therapy. You got to uh, doing the first step when I did my first step, which is anybody out there doesn't know what that is. For me, it was 20, 20 situations in my life that could have had disastrous consequences. You know, be that driving drunk, but not getting into an accident. Overdosing on cocaine, which I did, and I was in the hospital, but I didn't die. That was a bad. And it was only when I looked at those 20 incidents in my life, I thought, this is a crazy person. This person is insane and they're committing suicide slowly and haphazardly. And then I have to think, why do I want to die? Why am I trying to kill myself? Uh, and you have to look at that. And like I said, to and then also scientific lectures they had that were really good. They showed, you know, lungs with, coke, with free base smoke in them and livers with alcohol. And so there was the educational aspect and it was the fellowship meeting 
basically I was in a hall with 20 guys, all at various stages of nervous breakdowns, because that's sort of what you need to have. And we all were having them. It was funny and we were hysterical. Uh, and some people were much worse than, off than me and other people not as bad. So you weren't special. You could see how on the time-space continuum, you were just basically using drugs and drinking uh, excessively and suicidally. And I thought, I don't want to die. Uh, there is another way. I think I can handle it. This is, after all, what Joseph Campbell was teaching for all those years about the hero's journey. If you have to go off and have adventures and have culprits in your life and be betrayed and find a fair maiden and, and do what you got to do. And then you got to come back home and live your authentic life after having been out there. And that was me. Cause I got sober in my forties. My son was 19 and he was done somehow. He embraced this life. Thank God. I put my tortured, my mother, you know, every time her phone rang, she thought they're, I'm in the hospital or I'm in jail. Uh, and she got a call from a hospital once and said, you better fly to Los Angeles from Philadelphia because there's a 50-50 chance you're going to be flying home with your son's body because I was unconscious. I was dying. They brought me back to life. And she, she uh, so that's how bad it got for me. But that didn't even make me think of stopping using. Didn't even consider it. I switched from vodka to gin, to Bombay gin, because there's herbs in it, and I thought it would be healthy. So I, I went from vodka, which is I thought was the culprit, to gin. Uh, it, it was, I lived an insane life, and it wasn't until I had that 28 days to reflect and think. And of course, nowadays, they didn't let you have cell phones. There was no TV. There was, you know, 12-step literature, and people to talk to, and yourself to, to, to sit under a tree and think about your life and have writing assignments every day. So you could hear the, 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 you know, the pencil on the paper and realize this was your life that you were writing about. This wasn't someone else's life. It's a fabulous. I tell rehab for narcissists is amazing because all they want to do is talk about you. All they want you to do is talk about yourself. So rehabs are great for narcissists. Uh, nowadays, I hear you can have cell phones. Uh, it doesn't seem like a place to go. When I was in Betty Ford Center, which is where my son went, and they filled out the 20 questions. I'm sure some people are familiar with the 20 questions of if you're an alcoholic. Yeah. I was there with the counselor and I answered them. And the one that said, have you ever been institutionalized for your... And I wrote, no. And she said you've never been institutionalized for your drug use or alcoholism. I said, no. She said, you're in an institution now. <laughs> it's like the state of denial. Like, oh yeah, I am finally an institution. I just thought it was another prior, another hotel with nurses all over. Uh, so I think the state of, so that's it. You know, when you call, the admissions person, I tell people, ask them how long have they worked there and make sure they're actually there on site, although now it's different because of the COVID, but make sure it's not a call center where they're just shuffling people around, you know, and ask how long have you worked there? And if they've worked there for three months, don't go. Go to a place that can keep their employees happy and healthy. Go to a place that has a reputation. Uh, I would look for a nonprofit before a for-profit, although there's a lot of great for-profits as well. Uh, I just say, check out their reputation. And I don't think you can do that online. I think you have to do it with phone calls because everything online is manipulable, manipulable, bull. can be manipulated by money and advertising and bullshit. So call people, ask people you know who are sober, where did you go? Where did you recommend? Sometimes it's better to get out of town. Uh, I know that right now I hear rehabs take people out to AA meetings. They do that in Malibu where people are spending 30, 40, 
they put you in a little van and they drive you to AA meetings that everybody else there is paying a dollar to attend and you're paying thousands. Mm -hmm. And if they had done that at Betty Ford, I wouldn't still be sober because if they put me in a van and drove me somewhere, I would have looked at the local movie theater and thought, oh, I'd rather be in that movie theater. Or if they drove past the bar, I'd rather be at the bar. Or, you know, I, I, it would have wanted to, me to continue to get outside myself. So I was solitude, seclusion, whatever you want to call it. I didn't leave the property for 28 days. And there's no better method to look at yourself is to stay with yourself. Absolutely. Someone once said, I don't know, maybe you know who, uh, all the problems in the world are because it's hard to just sit with yourself for 20 minutes. Uh, and, I, tell, and I tell clients all the time, if you can learn to just sit still and be okay with it, you're in a great place. Yeah, and I think people in recovery, you know, I miss the holding hands and saying a serenity prayer holding people's hand and praying five times a week, which is how often I would go to meetings. is just so special and I miss it. We don't hold hands on Zoom. No. Um, and, you, know, you, brought up, you brought up something interesting I was thinking about when you were saying this is that, you know, with, you know, and as a counselor, and, and I know you're a counselor too, mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if I'm working at a treatment facility that is not free, I don't teach things to people that they can get for free, which is the 12 steps. Uh huh. You know, okay. I, I teach them things that are unique, that are outside the box, that are something that they're not going to learn, you know, from just going to now. Obviously, we want to introduce people to the 12 step program mm -hmm. and stuff like yes. that because it is by far the best self help program out there. Right. It's, and it is attraction, not coercion. I love that. Yes. So as a counselor, where did you work, may I ask? And are you at liberty to reveal that? Uh, well, currently right now I work at uh, New Creation College. I actually teach people that are working to become counselors. What state uh, is that in? Oh, I'm, I'm actually in L.A. County. I'm in, uh, I work in Rancho Cucamonga. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, is that a is that a sweet is that a Swanson facility? It is. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's got his house and her house and you know the treatment. Yes. Building, but then we also yeah. have the college. I've also worked for um, Southern California Addiction Center. I used to own a program in 2009 to 2012 called Serenity Life Counseling in Anaheim. Okay. That program we focused on alternative sentencing. That was mm -hmm. my big passion. Was um, and I love, I love alternative sentencing. There shouldn't be sentencing to begin with. Absolutely. I and I love that you said um, that we should legalize drugs. I'm a hundred percent on board. It would eliminate so many problems out there. It would solve so many problems too, because all that tax money and money that wasn't spent on police and insurance could be spent on free treatment for everyone. And God knows that big pharma should be paying for every overdose funeral in the country uh, because they cause them in some indirect or direct fashion. With the pharmaceutical companies? Yes. They should be paying for funerals. You know, one of my, uh, one of my good friends is Jody Barber. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I did. Oh. And the anti marijuana girl. Uh, Jody? Yeah. No, Jody's uh, Overtaken, the documentary. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and she did die, Overtaken and Overtaken too. And, you know, it was her son yeah. that uh, died of an overdose. Um, uh, we showed the movie and we had her at the film festival. Must be five or six years now. Amazing. Like her first Undertaken, yeah. Overtaken. Yeah, Bummer. Sure. She was on, I did an episode of, with her on my podcast too. Um, and uh, yeah. she's got an amazing story and I, I agree hundred percent. I, I actually um, had done a little, <laughs> had done a little experiment <clears throat> and I went to the doctor that her son had been getting all of those medications. Well, he was <laughs> working out of a Starbucks at some point. No, 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 no. He's, he's uh, down in South County. He's okay, I'm thinking of a, of a, of a woman 
who was featured in the movie Beyond, Be, Behind the Orange Curtain. Okay. Which was a predecessor about, our, about Orange County, how many people were dying from overdoses in a very rich community. But anyway, you went to the doctor. Yeah, so I had gone, and I, I actually created a short video that I have up on my YouTube on this also, but I, I had gone down there and I did a pre-visit pre, pre and then a following visit meeting with him. After two visits with this guy, I had, I had three per separate prescriptions of Adderall, the highest milligram possible. Now I was a meth addict, and that was my drug of choice. Mm -hmm. um, I had, um, so I had Adderall, I had a uh, prescription of Wellbutrin, I had a prescription of some other one, I don't remember the name of it, um, and Trazodone, um, and one other medication, just within two visits with this guy. Because you were telling him you were having symptoms? I, I can't focus, I can't concentrate, I can't hold a job, my wife's getting ready to leave me because I, um, because I, I'm using... Give me a Viagra. <laughs> but no, I knew that I knew the right shit to say for the Adderall though, you know, and, uh, and it was, I mean, it was just unbelievable how easy it was. Um, that's the medical, that's the AMA, the AMA. I, I read that they have a lot of their retirement funds in big pharma stock. Okay. And they get, they get a lot of benefits from prescribing medication. This guy had a, an entire cabinet that was um, full of samples. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he was, wasn't in a, in, a, in, a, in a playground in a high school, right? No, no, no. <laughs> no, thank God. Um, but, uh, but he was very, it was odd. He took, out the, he took out a sample. He pulled out two pills. He cut them in half and he put them in a bindle for me. He literally took a sticky note, yeah. put them in there, rolled it up in a bindle and handed it to me. <laughs> and you put it in that little pocket in your jeans? For like <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was uh, it, it was just unbelievable. Did you have a hidden camera in your briefcase? You know, the second time that I went, I had I had bought one of those New York Yankee hats that's got a little camera. Mm -hmm. And so I did I was wearing that when I went in the second time. Um, the thing cut out um, before he had written me all the prescriptions for Adderall. But I took pictures of it. Like I got all these on my lap, all these prescriptions. <laughs> and what is to become of this gentleman other than a happy retirement and a gold watch? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, they force him to go to funerals for his patients? No. And he, the guy's been on, the guy's been, um, on probation like three or four times, and he still has a license. Well, if you read the Addiction Recovery e-bulletin, we were thinking of having a weekly column, doctor arrested. But we decided we didn't want to be that negative. But at least once a month, these pill, pill, pill mills, uh, which are fortunately, you know, dying down a little, but there's, but there's still people who run pill mills. And, uh, you know, like I've always said, poverty is not the problem greed is the problem mm -hmm. and uh, people would make money at the expense of other people's lives uh, like it was nothing because I don't know what it's like to be that greedy fortunately um, but I guess if some people do and that's more important than the lives of other human beings, but I guess it's always been that way. Um, and yeah, everyone's just, what can I say? It's a tragic situation in America and in other countries, but here it seems to be more, they call it savage capitalism, yep. that literally the bottom line on your computer will dictate policy of the company regardless of how many people get hurt.
you know, going back to the great <clears throat> Ralph Nader, his book, Unsafe at Any Speed, I guess you have to be over 60 to know that book, where he proved that the, cor the company that made Corvair, I think it was Chevy, they actually did a study. They knew the Corvair would, would uh, roll over at a certain speed, at a certain angle. Okay, they knew it, that it didn't have, the chassis wouldn't hold it and they would flip over and people would hurt and get hurt and die. And they did a report that said, it will cost them less money to go to court to defend themselves against these cases than it would to be to recall the cars and fix them. So the bottom line you know, made the determination that they would let people roll over and get killed rather than fix the cars. So I think that's true almost of, of any industry now, that the computers and the savage capitalism dictate how a company runs. I'm sure you've read about Walmart and CVS, how they were 100% accomplices with the opiate epidemic, that they turned a blind eye to a people, doctors over prescribing. You know, there's all those books about the town in Kentucky with 13,000 people was getting 50,000 oxys a month, and they weren't asking where they're all going. They're all going to people who used to be minors and now just can't handle life on life's terms and want to get high. And in a way, I don't blame them. I did that for a long time. Um, I'm just one of the lucky ones that didn't die uh, and, and found that I could live without drugs and alcohol and be happy. And still be, not, not be depressed, but be happy, actually. Happy, I still wake up with no hangover, and I'm thinking I'm grateful because I used to have hangovers that were like I'd, be, I'd poisoned myself with alcohol and drugs, and now I don't. So I, I haven't had a hangover in a long time, nor do I want one. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a remarkable way to live. I think it's incredibly rebellious to live without drugs and alcohol you're not buying into the system you're not being you, you, you know you're, you're it's a great way to live what can i tell you be a rebel don't get high there you go you, you want to be unique like i started to get high because i wanted to be unique there's nothing more unique than being clean and sober really we are the oddities of the world i mean who lives like us monks Maybe some authentic Mormons. <laughs> Nobody doesn't take shit right this day and age to, to deal with what's going on in the world and what's yeah. going on in their lives. And we do. I don't know why. It's eloquent. It's, it's, ele it's elegant yeah. to live without drugs and alcohol. It's very, it's really special, I think. I like what you said earlier, you know, I, and I've always told clients this, that you guys are the luckiest people in the world, you know, and you kind of like sort of what you sort of touch mm -hmm. on and, you know, and everybody in society has problems, you know, um, and some people, you know, you could be the workaholic, right? The workaholic loses the family also, the spouse mm -hmm. leaves, you know, um, have other issues out there, but you don't have enough pain to where you basically say, okay, the problem is me, I need to change. But with drug addicts and those of us that have that drastic sense of pain that smacks us in the face, mm -hmm. we realize that, you know what? Okay. We do have problems. And now I get to work on my self-esteem. I get to work on loving myself. I get to work on caring about myself where a lot of those people out there don't have an opportunity to look at that because they don't have the pain. Uh, I agree. I agree completely. We're, we're lucky. <laughs> we are. <laughs> we got lucky that we didn't die and found a solution. Uh, like I said, it's a very elegant way to live. And, uh, and I think no matter how boring, I used to teach it when I did my groups on finding your inner nerd. 
Like, if you're going to stay sober, you got to find some nerdiness about yourself. Like, you like to read books, or you like to walk dogs, whatever it is. Uh, get used to the board. More boredom will take people out. So do things to not be bored. And, uh, and, and mediocrity. You can't be mediocre in recovery. I just don't think it's possible. You know, I used to say, I used to, I, I, I have a memoir coming out. It's called At Play in the Fields of Addiction, meaning the addict's life and the drug, the drug dealer's life and the drug counselor's life. And I talk about watching uh, 9-11 with a friend of mine. Uh, you know, the, the planes going into the building. And she's smoking pot. Uh, and I say, it's like, she's smoking, she's getting high to watch people die. Now, she's not really getting high to watch people die. She's getting high because she can't not get high. And I was early in recovery then. I thought, wow, I am so happy to be able to not dull my senses or get high to watch people die that I can just, you know, feel what I'm feeling, horrible, frightened, and, and, and grief-stricken, but at least I'm not smoking pot. It's like I said, potheads will smoke pot for a wedding or a funeral. It doesn't matter. And, and like I said, the thing about pot is like, you go to work and you have a good day, you come home, you smoke a joint. And it's, you go to work, you come home, you have a bad day, you come home and smoke a joint. It's the equalizer, you know? So it makes a good day feel not as good because you're bad day. So it, it puts everything into not the middle path, but mediocrity. It makes everything more tolerable, less tolerable, but it, but it, it takes away the edges. You know, people say, oh, I get high, blah, blah, to take off the edges. The edges is, is, is where I want to live. You know, I like icicles. I like the edges. Uh, I don't want everything sanded over anymore. Uh, and to me, that's, that's what pot did. It made everything okay. You know, I, want, I don't want okay. I want, I want some contrast, which you get when you're on nothing, because everything is fucking intense, really intense. Uh, so I'm glad you feel the same way. That Absolutely. this is this is this is the better mousetrap, as I say. The twelve steps is the better mousetrap, and uh, and I'm glad I lived through that whole thing. And like I said, I have a memoir uh, coming out in six months. It's called "At Play in the Fields of Addiction." Uh, it's a recovery comedy. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that, and it's broken into parts. Is that well, it's just chapters. There's chapters. The, the website in the rooms dot com has has printed some excerpts from it. They've printed a chapter or two in the rooms dot com, uh, which is a great online resource. They were having online meetings twelve years ago for people in little towns or foreign countries where there weren't a lot of meetings like we have here in LA. Uh, so in the rooms.com and they're moderated and they're video. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good site in the rooms.com. Uh, and they started it with their hearts, not with their pocketbooks. Believe me. Yeah. yeah. So reputation is important for picking up, picking out a rehab. Uh, I always say, don't go to a rehab that doesn't have a waiting list. Because when I worked in Malibu, I worked at a place and there was one client who was misbehaving, setting fires in his room, doing all, but they wouldn't kick him out because there was no one waiting to take the room. Okay, so as long as he was paying, they kept him there, even though he was disruptive to some other clients. If there had been a waiting list, they would have booted him and brought in somebody new. So I tell people, don't go anywhere where there's not a waiting list. 
um, unless you need to get in right away, you know, and for, and uh, yeah, there's help for anybody at any age, any sex, anywhere. Uh, you just have, you know, is it, is it about being done? Is it about making a decision? Is it being, having the courage to face the unknown? Sobriety is the great unknown. Do you have the courage to walk down a path with that you don't know where it's going to go? But it's not going to go right to the grave like the other path. You just might not know how many, you know, <laughs> hardships you'll have that you can't numb yourself with substances. But isn't that cool? I, I was at a funeral when I was young. Guy's mother, we were throwing joints in the, in the grave. You know, because we, that's how much we believed in marijuana. That we threw a joints into the grave. Uh, now I just, you know, I don't need that. I just need my iPhone and I'll be fine. Yeah, and your question of what I think about treatment in the United States, there are definitely great programs out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and just like you said, it is about finding the right ones. I think the biggest failure that we find in treatment or out of treatment is aftercare. And I think that's where, um, you know, you can have the greatest programs out there that, you know, can teach, um, you know, all the great stuff and the good stuff and, and, you know, what to do. And, but what happens when people leave is where the it's up to them. I think it's up to them what happens to people after they leave. Isn't it? No, 100%. It is. And and I've always thought hard on how do we and this is and this again goes back to that real tough question is is you know since how do we help keep people or not keep people but but um, um, help people stay motivated. And mm -hmm. I've, I've felt that, you know, when I look at the people that do succeed, you know, you're an example of this. And you know, there's a lot of examples out there is that, you know, the people that succeed are the ones that have a direction. They know where they're going, what they're doing, why they're going to do it. That's not, that's not me at all. I had none of that. I've been a drug dealer for 24 years. I had no idea where I was going. When I got out of rehab, none whatsoever, no job prospects, no savings, no nothing. I had to start sort of selling off antiques and artworks just to, just to pay the rent. I knew nothing about what I was doing. I just knew it wasn't going to be to jail or to a hospital for an overdose. That's all I know. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes, like I say, you can never get lost if you don't know where you're going. You can never feel lost. Uh, I envy people who had jobs that they could go do a better job at. Uh, or I went back to college to get my certification as a drug counselor. Uh, you know, I did a lot of odd jobs, but I didn't have purpose. The purpose is to not destroy your family with grief for the rest of their lives by dying on them. That's good enough for me. I'm not here to save the mankind. I'm not here to help anybody. If I see trash on the street and there's a garbage can nearby, I will pick it up and put it in. Okay, that I'll do because I'm, I'm part of the community here. Uh, my purpose is to see how healthy I can be and how nice I can be to other people. You know, not, I'm not always successful. I was in custody for a while. Um, and when I was getting ready to re get released, I was scared to death. I, I had no confidence in my abilities that I was going to get out and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. you know, I had no, no tools, no goals, no, any of that kind of stuff. But I did sit on that same idea, though, that I knew what I didn't want, mm -hmm. you know, that I didn't want to continue the life that I was living. So I did have some kind of insight, you know, that, um, that I felt like, okay, there is something different. There's gotta be something bigger than this. 
And, and that was really what originally led me. I walked out those, I walked out those j- jail doors um, with very little confidence, you know, and I mean, cause I, all the other times that I did it, I walked out and I went to my dealer and what was I going to do this time? But I had this mindset of this is, I know I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I don't, I know I don't want to live this life anymore. And so the perspective, I guess, on, on, you know, having a goal or, or whatever, I mean, it's all, it's all relative, I think, to wherever you're at <laughs> at that time. Well, I, I guess I got lucky because I had two goals. I wanted to live indoors and I wanted to eat food. That's, that's really my goals. Uh, and everything, and, and, and to, uh, you know, I was going to mention God or universe or universal oneness. I got very lucky. I found the Agape International Church of Spiritual Enlightenment about 15 years ago. And uh, the whole praying and meditating thing, it's brilliant that the 11th step talks about prayer and meditation. How brilliant were they in 1935 to include the word meditation and not just prayer, being that it was a spiritual, being that it was a Christian program that it's all based on, that they threw in that word meditation, saved them. I mean, not saved them, made them. I'm sure. Uh, so it's like, yes, can I increase my meditation from 15 minutes a day to 20? I'm not ready to try it yet. I'm too impatient. I'm too impatient. Uh, the whole. You know, I think AA can save the, the planet. That's how, I, that's how powerful I think the steps and the traditions are. I wouldn't have joined a club like this just to save myself. I think it can save a lot of people. I think all the sober people walking around LA up-level the vibration of our whole community. You know, and I see them out on the street. And I see, you know, I used to see them out on the street. Uh, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, what's the, you know, the turn my will and my power over, turn my will and power and will over to the care of God? That's some heavy stuff. I said, yeah, why not? What do I have to lose? And it seems like it worked out because my desire for drugs and alcohol left me when that's all I had for all those years. Uh, so it's, it's been, you know, quite an, an, an adventure. And, and uh, I, I can't, what can I say? Oh, God. But to me, talking about your spiritual practice in public is like talking about how much money you have. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's, it should be bragged about or even talked about because it's personal except all the ministers I love who talk about it all the time. I love them because they're so confident. And I love 11-step meetings. I love AA meetings that start with five minutes of meditation. It's fantastic. And I love AA because it ends every meeting with a prayer. Uh, and that's, that's um, something I remember growing up, I did LSD. And, and I went to some friends, I said, I did LSD and I saw God. And they said, well, we're going to the racetrack. Why don't you take some more of that LSD and see if you can see a winner? <laughs> yeah, so it, it gave me, yeah, anyway. Uh, so that's my, I was a compulsive gambler for a long time. I'm so glad to be off that because I hear more people commit suicide from being from gambling addiction than anything else. Uh, Cause you can only snort so much or shoot so much in a given day, but you can bet a hundred thousand dollars on a football game and they will take your money. And to try and explain that to the wife <laughs> when they come for the house and the car. <laughs> anyway, right. so we, we're, we're, this is grand. I, I'm glad this is going to go somewhere. And you're going to promote this, and we're going to get friendly again, and we're going to see each other in person when the lockdown is over, right? 
Yeah, I would absolutely love to. I'd love to hook up with you and meet you in person. Um, I want to give you an opportunity really quick before we cut short. Um, is there something that you would like to say that um, I haven't brought up or that you were, were uh, would like to discuss? <laughs> Mm. 2021 <laughs> uh, how wrong did everybody get in their predicting how good 2020 was going to be <laughs> I'm going uh, to keep a positive note 2021 is going to be a better year <laughs> it has it could not be worse I get, maybe it could be I don't know you know what did you say clean house Keep your own side of the street clean. Uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, study the cosmos as much as possible. Uh, there's a meteor shower this this coming weekend. Uh, you know, how dependable has the sun been for all these years? Every morning, it's there, shining and helping plants grow so that we can have food to eat and food for the animals to eat that we can eat. Uh, pray there's no earthquakes, which there always are. Uh, you know, I, I get to be a little dy dystopian lately. You know, uh, we are living through this extraordinary time this is so historical. I thought I was going to be able to get out of this life without living through a nuclear war. So far, so good. But then this thing happens, and we have 300,000 dead on the street. Okay, maybe they're in hospitals. The Mar has 300,000 dead, more than Nagasaki, more than Hiroshima, dead for lack of leadership. Okay, dead for population control purposes, I suspect. I don't know why this is happening. Dead because we deforest the rain, because we messed up the rainforest and species are interbreeding and then spreading it to us. I don't know. Uh, you know, is it all because of a bad bat? Some bat? Is it? I, I don't know. <laughs> Misinformation? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, vaccination. My son just got vaccinated. He works in treatment. You know, when he was 19, he went away for a month and never used again. You know, didn't need 60, 90 days because he knew it was a good idea. And he, and he knew that there was a program for people who were, his intention it was to stay off drugs and alcohol. And he was a stone cold alcoholic. Trust me, I, 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 I knew that. At his age, he loved drinking, uh, but hasn't had a drink in 20 years. Mm. So it's, you know, uh, recovery is a family affair. Don't, you know, there's, there, there's tough love, but there's cruel love, tough love. I don't know what to say about anything, actually. Uh, to thine own self be true. Find a good... Netflix show and, and, and be loyal to it. Right now I'm loyal to the crown. It's fantastic. Uh, be happy you have a phone or a computer to watch this on because there's a lot of people who don't. Uh, so we can stay connected digitally, electronically. Some people can't. Uh, yeah, so. the, people that, the people that really, really probably need to hear a lot of this stuff are not able to. Well, find a rooftop and, and, and get a kazoo or a megaphone and get out there. That's what I wanted to do when I got sober. I wanted to go to all the bars I used to hang out and give out, <laughs> give out meeting schedules. Like, oh my God, have you heard of this? Did you know that people live without drinking every night? It's unbelievable. How do they do that? Anyway, I love doing it. It's been great talking to you, Eric. Absolutely. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you too. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Bye.